this week on War Mysteries, I'm joined by my brother Matt. Hi. I'm Jay. And we are looking into the disappearance of Hans Kammler. One of the most evil men in Nazi Germany that managed to escape justice. So, you're going to enjoy this one. Alright? I know nothing you. about him. You don't know anything about him? I'm so, you really don't know. genuinely doesn't know. I should have worn black, really. Awful. This guy, that's him. Probably the most powerful man in Nazi Germany to have escaped justice. He had oversight of almost everything, including the old V2 there, that, that little sausage. V2? <clears throat> you big don't rocket. have to hold it up. Big rocket. <clears throat> Pop that down. Okay, let's get into it. General Hans Kammler was a senior member of the Nazi party during the later stages of World War II. He was directly responsible for a number of projects and programs, including oversight of weapons manufacturing plants and concentration camp administration, as well as having been appointed General of the Waffen SS, the military arm of the Nazi secret police. He was described as the most powerful man in the Third Reich outside of high command, and a fanatical and dedicated Nazi officer. Fanatical. <laughs> it's quite an extreme word, isn't it? He was fanatical. He, were, he was dedicated to his work. Apparently demanded the same from others. And if you didn't obey him, <laughs> he was not a particularly nice man. That's, that's good tea. His actions led him to become one of the most wanted war criminals in history. And by all accounts, he should have been captured, tried and executed for his crimes. In early May of 1945, Kamler disappears without trace from history. So what happened to him? <clears throat> Got beamed off. <laughs> beamed off? What do you mean beamed off? Beamed off into space on beamed one of up. these rockets. Just beamed up. One of these bad boys. <laughs> reckon he just got inside. I think he just held on. <clears throat> held on. <laughs> could have done. He could have just upped and vanished. We've got to get more of this. From mid-1944, Kamler steadily advanced his career as an officer of the Reich. He became more or less solely responsible for an increasing number of very important projects and assets as the war progressed, owing to his dedication to the Nazi party and his strong engineering background. He held Bachelor of Science, PhD, he was a doctor. He was clever. He was a doctor. <laughs> very clever. Um, were they legitimate though? Well, you never know, do you? You never know. You know. Back you in the know. day, I mean, it's not, it's not like today, you can't just, you know, <laughs> Photoshop something. It would have been pretty tricky, but I don't know, you can just write your name on a bit of paper. No, they were forging stuff. They were forging stuff. Of course they were. Cold it. Cold it. Prisoners of war forging stuff to get away. So no, I think you could have they could be fake. Fake knots. <clears throat> well, you know, maybe he could have done. <clears throat> but he was a very intelligent man. Just, you know, morally decrepit. By late 1944, Allied bombing raids were steadily destroying German industry. Good. <laughs> Good, yeah, to be fair. And with the report from the German legation in Lisbon that the US would have an atomic bomb field ready by October reaching high command in July, Kamler was tasked with redeploying aircraft production facilities for the emergency fighter program. So, Eichel 162, Messerschmitt 163. Okay. The little ones. Not them. Those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Lessons. Never too old to learn. He would order construction of underground factories to protect them from air raids, utilising forced labour, a decision that likely prolonged the war and doubtless contributed to the death of tens of thousands of prisoners and civilians. When asked about the labour's welfare, he commented, Don't worry about them. The work must proceed on schedule. Bit cold. Yeah. Not even a union, really. Slave labourer. <clears throat> They were slaves, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Partially on the advice of Joseph Goebbels in March 1945. You bastard. <laughs> he was a real... He was... Uh, a shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't like him. Uh, but we know what happened to him. So. Partially on the advice of Joseph Goebbels, 
in March 1945, Hitler began to delegate more and more responsibility towards Kammler, likely as a result of the increasingly desperate situation in Berlin. By late March, Kammler oversaw, directed, or had complete autonomy of the following assets. So, manufacturing plants for jet aircraft. All of them. Uh, manufacturing plants and facilities for all missile projects. So, V1, V2, Enzian, Fritz X, the lot. Uh, all missile launch facilities. Um, tank production facilities, which were mainly based, I think, in Ebon Sea, which we'll find out later, which was a big labour camp, mm -hmm. like, like Auschwitz. Uh, labour management, so the use of concentration camp interns and prisoners of war. Uh, development of more efficient body cremation facilities for Auschwitz Birkenau. So ovens. Not very nice. Uh, oversight of forced labour deployment for the production of aircraft and manufacturing. So not only did he look after um, or have oversight of factories and plants, he also oversaw the people that were doing the jobs. So he was he he had a global view of it. Also, various special weapons projects, including allegedly Project Kronos. Now we'll go into that at another point because Kronos is a bit of a grainy picture of him. Can you get a better one? <coughs> well, it, yeah, it was taken probably about that big. Will we add him to the wall? Oh no, probably we'll, probably not there. <laughs> we'll we'll probably burn that. Yeah. Um, not the kind of person you want to keep a picture of. The extent of Kambler's culpability is perhaps best illustrated with an example. The Messerschmitt 262 fighter aircraft were principally constructed by slave labour. At the Gusen II camp in Austria during 1944, an estimated 35 to 50,000 labourers perished as a direct result of the camp conditions, hazardous environment in which they were forced to work, and as punishment at the hands of camp personnel. So, when we, uh, so where, where, where's it going then? Where's this going? Why did, he, why did he get all the control and everything? In December 1944, a sudden counterattack was staged by the Wehrmacht and SS divisions, attempting to blockade the Allied forces approaching the Rhine. Stone. Yeah, and they were encircled. And then, of course, Patton comes in with the Third Army, breaks them out, they push forward, and eventually they take the Rhine, the Rhine area. And obviously, the Rhine area is the last natural fortification. It's, it's a natural border, so the only way across is obviously a, a, a bridge. So the Allies need to find one intact, and obviously the Germans are destroying them at this point, so they've got to stop them, they've got to stall them. Bridge too far. That's Arnhem, but... <clears throat> Film. The, the comment's relevant. Oh. Once everyone saw over that bridge at Remagen, they're in. Give it a minute, because that's definitely going to show up. Yeah. You can cut that bit out. Couldn't cut that bit out. Couldn't afford a studio, so we're in the garage. It's very echoing. <clears throat> we'll find out. However, it became obvious to German high command by early January that their gambit had failed, as the Soviet Red Army had launched their own offensive to the east, and the vast majority of manpower and equipment had to be transferred to counter it. Germany's days were numbered. Obviously, the Russians have a huge land army. And, I mean, even the Air Force is considered part of the Red Army. So Germany's days were numbered then? You just read my script. Yeah. On March 7th, uh, the now relatively unimpeded Allies discovered uh, an almost fully intact bridge in the ancient town of Remagen, I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. The Germans tried to bomb it, they tried to hit it with artillery, they tried to uh, destroy it from the air. They couldn't. Did nothing. I mean, they'd actually planted charges on this bridge, um, but they didn't go off. Well, no, one did. Not enough for shoddy. <clears throat> Why all the hoo-ha about the bridges? Why not just make a bridge? Like nowadays, just they just they turn up and they just literally build a bridge and go plonk like that and then just drive straight over it. So why didn't they do that? Um, they got this. We can do this. They can no, do that's that. The they Germans, can, yeah, though, yeah. Right. Well, well, so they could do that. Well, we I mean, you make know, a bridge. they crossed the Rhine, March seventh. Germany is now defenceless with regards to landmass. Mm. So they got over on an old school bridge, a proper one that Germans couldn't get. Uh, I, but, yeah, I think it was actually a railway bridge with tracks. Um, and they just... On oh, a train. Went. I don't think they used the train. The Russians used trains. They used the Germans' own rail networks to get into Berlin in the end. Never. Very clever. Cheaper. <laughs> okay. As the uh, Soviet Red Army approached and encircled Berlin on the trains, three million men. A few of them then. Mm. Quite a few. <laughs> After word of Adolf Hitler's suicide on April 30th, 
uh, Kamler had already left the Berlin defense area. So here is a breakdown of his movements based on sightings and confirmed reports up until his disappearance. So day by day. All right, so this is after all that's gone down. Uh, this is, well, it starts in late March. Late March, 1945. While traveling through Sauerland, Kamler's vehicle is blocked by approximately 200 refugees fleeing the war to the east, consisting of men, women, and children from labor camps. He orders his ZV2 division to execute them all for the inconvenience. April 1st, ordered to evacuate missile technicians and specialists and to relocate them to the east, away from the advancing forces. April 5th, ordered by Oberkommando de Wehrmacht to assume command of all V2 launch sites in the Nordhausen area, possibly to attack the city should Berlin fall. April 16th, sends a telegram to Albert Speer, Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring in Berlin advising them that a message centre has been established in Munich and that a supervisor has been appointed to oversee the ME-262 production programme. April 20th. Arrives in Salzburg with a number of technicians and personnel, spending time at Hindler's Kommandostelle. His crib. His crib. Himmler's crib. Just chilling at Himmler's crib. What would you do if you were at Himmler's crib? Yeah, they'd probably just check out the artwork. Da Vinci's The Mona Lisa would probably be there. <laughs> Have some yeah. nice whiskey that I can't pronounce. Just generally live it up. Yeah. Party like it's 1939. Yeah. April 22nd. According to a recovered diary entry, Kamler arrives in Linderhof, having apparently departed Salzburg the previous day, much to the annoyance of locals. Accompanying him are some 600 men and in good quality vehicles and trucks. He turns up with of his chaps, all in trucks, they cars. They book out all the premier inns. Yeah, completely. <laughs> all the hotel ibis. Yeah, all the cheese, all the wine, <clears throat> all the ladies, exactly. all the beer. Killed, Beer's gone. Ki killed all the. <laughs> okay, let's keep a lid on that. April twenty third sends a radio message from the Linderoff area to his Berlin offices, ordering his manager to organise the immediate destruction of all V1 equipment in the Berlin area, and advising his staff to then evacuate to Munich. He presumably does not know at this point that central Berlin is already occupied by the Soviets. Approximately April 25th, inspects the Messerschmitt research facilities, at the time housing experimental weapons, including the Ensian missile prototype. Uh, which, at the time, I don't really need those anymore. No. <laughs> she went off to do a random inspection, even though they don't really need, even though it's likely they get bombed. Still keeping up on the health and safety checks. I yeah. like it, efficient. Yeah. Very efficient. You know, true to the cause, looking after his, looking after his own. While on site, rocketry specialist Werner von Braun claims to overhear a conversation between Kambler and his subordinates, detailing their intention to hide in the nearby Etal Abbey. See, I'd have been out there by now. I'd have been gone. I'd have been to the Argentina by now. They caught this other guy then. This Werner. Uh, Werner. Werner. Yeah, he's very famous. He went over to the US during Operation Paperclip. Nazi. He claims he was just a member. Who you needed to be? Just a member of the party. Yeah. <clears throat> was he condoning it? We never know. He's dead now anyway, so you know. April twenty eighth. Kamler departs Linderhof and is again headed for Salzburg, where he attends a tank conference. <laughs> he's really chilling out, isn't he? Considering he's that, pushing, uh, he's pushing his luck a bit now. Considering the, the 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 Soviets are there taking over, he's really he's calm. He's just <laughs> he's really chilled about yeah, it. He's uh, he's not he's not fussed. Still fulfilling all his diarised appointments, <laughs> uh, tank conferences. Health and safety checks what and measure his good factories. That, you know what I mean? What good would a tank conference be at that point? And then uh, and afterwards he goes to inspect tank track production and special projects. Getting niche. It's, oh, he might be in denial. <laughs> you reckon? Well, denial. He's just going through his diary, bombs are going off. Literally Americans, British and Soviet troops running all over Germany. <laughs> and he's still, he's just checking his diary every morning and still hitting the, yeah, hitting like, that Panzer conference. Like, Shortly afterwards, he moves on to Ebensee, visiting Villa Mendelssohn to inspect tank track production facilities and other special projects. 
Evansy also houses a large forced labour camp. Lot on his plate. Then they all had lot on their plates, didn't they, towards the end? So. Yeah, well, then they kind of lent on him heavily towards the end of the war, which is why he's such a big deal. Not, not even, a, not even a, a, a glimmer of worry at this point. April 30th. Munich is taken by Allied forces. Hitler apparently commits suicide in the Führer bunker. May 2nd. All organised resistance in Berlin ceases. May 4th. Kamler allegedly arrives in the Tyrol region to visit his wife. He is said to provide her with two cyanide tablets during this time. Two's a bit excessive. I mean, one will kill you. Two, you know, just... Make double sure. She might lose one. <laughs> because or she was one for the dog. A bit forgetful. <laughs> for the dog. May 5th. At 4 a.m., Kamler is claimed to have left Tyrol, bound for Prague in Czechoslovakia. May 7th. The last alleged eyewitness account of Kamler in Prague is made by Ingeborg Alex Prinzessin zu Schaumburg Lippe. That's a stupid name. That, that's a real, that's ridiculous. Admiral Karl Dönitz, newly appointed successor of Hitler, orders the unconditional surrender of Germany. At this point, Kamler effectively vanishes and only circumstantial evidence is available as to his whereabouts and ultimate fate. Let's explore what may have happened, about which there are three theories. The first theory, he's dead. The most popular theory is that Kamler died in Prague, either in combat with partisans, at the hands of his aides, or by suicide. Let's examine some evidence that may help to prove this. Supporting the notion that Kamler was killed is a statement made by Kurt Pruck, his personal chauffeur, in late 1945, known as the Pruck Statement. Pruck said that he saw Kamler's corpse and attended his burial, and that this happened on May 9th, 1945. How's that then? Well, that's the day after the day. Well, it's two days after uh, Germany capitulates. Well, they're voting quick. <laughs> you'd, never get in. you'd never get in. The amount of people being killed around that time, you'd never get a book in that quick, would you? Well, the victory just wouldn't be available. <laughs> it was quite high up. What, you want to bury everybody in three days? No, mate. Kamler's widow petitioned to have her husband declared legally dead in July 1945 a request that was substantiated by a legal body based in berlin Charlottenburg in 1948. To have done this suggests that she trusted Kurt Pruck at his word, as she cited this statement as first-hand evidence of his death. No sightings of General Kamler can be confirmed or proven beyond reasonable doubt after he left Lindorf in early May, and this could suggest he was killed in the following days. Kamler himself was said to have spoken to a member of the Helferinen Corps in Prague, stating, The Americans are after me and have made me offers, but I refuse them. He then went on to add, they won't take me alive. He's in Prague. You know, he knows, he knows the Yanks are coming. Oh, scheiße. Those Yankee doodles. <laughs> they won't take me alive. <laughs> well, they got him. In later years, the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee, based in London, England, received reports from the US 12th Army that Kamler had committed suicide on or around May 9th in Prague. According to a 1969 book by author Bernd Ruland, Kamler was claimed by his aide Zuna to have arrived in Prague on May 4th by aircraft, not by car, as Pruk had suggested. And he and some 20 SS officers became caught up in a battle with around 500 Czech resistance fighters. It is suggested that this is a battle that Kamler and his fellow men would lose, with Zuna stating that on May 9th, Kamler was shot by his aide, Sturmbanführer Stark, to prevent his capture. This is said to have been taken from testimony of Major General Walter Dornberger, a German army artillery officer at the time, who in turn claimed to have heard this from eyewitnesses to the attack. So let's now look into why some of this evidence may not add up. By early May, most, if not all, of the Nazi party members, officers and conspirators would have known the war was effectively over, 
and would have begun to consider their options. Stories of brutal executions, torture, and the murderous rampages of the Soviet army would also have reached them. This would naturally have led to a preference in surrendering to US, British, or Canadian forces in the area, who were seen to be more lenient. When Berlin was taken by the Third Shock Army, the, the, the Soviets, there were three million men that went into Germany. Uh, the Germans had 40,000 civilians and 45,000 army officers and soldiers left. That's it. Not good odds. Not really. No, I wouldn't. I, if I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put money on that. It must be assumed that Nazis would tell their captors whatever they wanted to hear and would therefore embellish their stories to suit themselves, to diminish their responsibility or to mislead their enemy. It's disputed that Kamler could actually have visited the Tyrol region on May 4th, as this does not seem to coincide with US troop movements at the time. The US 103rd Infantry held Innsbruck on May 4th, along with the US 44th Infantry in the region of Tyrol. Additionally, the US 80th Infantry arrived at Ebensee around the 4th to the 5th of May, liberating the camp and the work complexes making it very likely that Kamler would have in fact been apprehended by US forces had he been there. Yeah, he wouldn't want to be in that area, would he really? Not really. Um, 103rd over here, 44th coming in. Still following his diary, so looking after his dog. Not good odds. Okay, okay. I thought. Again. <laughs> Prook claimed in his statement that he and Kamler travelled everywhere by car and therefore it would have been impossible to have bypassed US roadblocks in the area. Everywhere by car. Which doesn't add up to what Zuna said, who was one of his closest aides. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore it would have been uh, impossible to have bypassed US roadblocks in the area. And that makes sense to me. If he was travelling by car, I mean by now the Allies are all over Germany, Bavaria, Austria. Swarming. They're swarming. So, is he dead? I mean, he's definitely dead now. but. Did he die? I would like to think so. Theory number two, capture and arrest by US forces. Extensive search efforts were already in place at the time as part of the later declassified Operation Paperclip and Kamler's broad oversight of advanced experimental aircraft production, access to documentation, and the locations of the prototypes, coupled with his well-documented background of engineering, would have made him a very high-profile target for acquisition. He's very, very clued up on all this, because he's had oversight of it. No. He's, he's an important figure. He knows some good stuff. He knows some good stuff. He's got some good information. On May 21st, a thorough inventory of personnel involved in these experimental rocketry, missile and aircraft programmes was made by US forces including those stationed at the Peenemunde Research Facilities, a facility that Kamler oversaw. Kamler would almost certainly have been high on this list, if not present already. A 1949 investigative report made by Oscar Pack clearly stated that Kamler was arrested on May 9, 1945, in the vicinity of the Linderoff Oberammergau Messerschmitt Experimental Works. The place he went to do the... Where, where he was chilling with Himmler in the uh, commander's still okay. with, you know, all the beer. Other evidence does seem to suggest that Kamler was indeed here, such as Werner von Braun's testimony that Kamler intended to hide in the near abbey. So that does support that. Pat Behind a gravestone. Poignant, since he may soon have been under one. He believed Kamler escaped, possibly in the direction of Italy or Austria. Now, Italy... It's probably more likely in my book because that's where his wife was. Mm -hmm. Or Austria, which was further from the front lines. Similar food. <laughs> Similar food, yeah. Sausage. Yeah. An investigative file was created for a general Hans Kammler at the time, including several possible locations in which he could be hiding, such as Munich, which suggests that authorities were indeed after him. This is substantiated by reports that he was spotted in the Haas region as early as April 8th or 9th and clearly points towards a manhunt. A retired serviceman, Donald W. Richardson, 
who was involved with both Operation Paperclip and the Alsace mission, claimed on his deathbed that, I supervised one Hans Kammler until 1947. He was held in a maximum security prison with no mercy, no hope, and without seeing the light of day until he hanged himself. Now, the Alsace mission was a detachment of personnel who was supposed to be looking for the German atomic bomb project. Mm. It's always on like a deathbed, isn't it? I mean, bring end. this information to light a bit earlier, we can bloody do something about it. Leaving it till the end. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, Tommy, uh, I, I looked after Kamala. Irresponsible. And he's a military man. These testimonies do not offer any concrete evidence that Kamala was ever apprehended, however. So, he may have been captured and then killed. And hanging himself, that other guy was saying. Well, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the uh, top-ranking officers did. Uh, I mean, Himmler killed himself, cyanide. I think Goering shot himself, I can't remember. Additionally, Kamler's widow would doubtless have been contacted, or at least interviewed, by military personnel after the war, and yet she still insisted on having her husband declared dead. No trace of Kamler's name can be found on any documents of arrest, nor has any quantifiable evidence of interrogation or escape come to light in subsequent years. Okay. Nothing hard that says General Hans Kammler dead, or General Hans Kammler tosser, or General Hans Kammler locked him into prison without any hope or any mercy. Deceased. <laughs> yeah, dead. Had Kammler been taken to the US as part of Operation Paperclip, his identity would have been altered, but his physical appearance would have remained the same and no one came forth to say so. And there were, there is evidence to say that people uh, were offered financial incentives to, to finger the, not literally finger them, to root them out, root them out. Finally, no war crimes trial was ever held for anyone who was represented under the name Hans Kammler. So there are no official documents. But having said that, a lot of them have been lost. A lot of them have been locked away. But there's just nothing on paper that says this piece of shit, was put in a prison cell and died. Nothing like that. Our last proposal is less popular, but perhaps the most sinister. So, proposal three, he got away. In the months after the collapse of the Reich, many top-ranking Nazi officers, including Martin Bormann and the monstrous Joseph Mengele, managed to evade capture entirely and escape Berlin. Some were never found. Could Kamler have similarly slipped away? Joseph Mengele, the, uh, the angel of death, he escaped. Bastard. Argentina, in particular, was known to have been sympathetic to the Nazi ideology at the time. Railroad networks were thought to have been in place by March 1945, allowing Nazi officials to escape capture from the advancing Allied forces. Given that there is no grave, no corpse, and no physical evidence of a body, nor any concrete evidence of capture, execution, or trial, it is at least logical to suppose that Kamler may have escaped. Makes sense. About a why? Yeah. He could, have, he could well have jumped the border. Maybe. Probably not. His extensive network of colleagues and knowledge of likely areas of interest to the Allies would have been a huge advantage. By simply avoiding these hotspots, he could greatly increase his chances of evading his enemies. He would have had access to a huge variety of transport. Experimental planes, experimental vehicles, uh, tanks. He knew exactly where they were. He had oversight of the lot, so he's got a huge advantage. Mm. But on the other side of the coin, those are going to be hotspots for the Allies. And knowing where those locations were, all he had to do was avoid them. And that would massively increase his chances of getting away. Probably earthed on a bike. Push bike. <laughs> Running away from the Allies, tanks coming after him, you know, bombers, fighter planes after him. And he's on a push bike. German engineering. Conceivably, these machines would have had superior range and speed compared to Allied technology of the time. A popular, though admittedly unlikely theory, claims that Kamler fled to the location of Project Riser, a vast network of underground tunnels beneath the Owl Mountains in Lower Silesia where he traded blueprints and experimental weapons for his freedom. Riser is German for the giant. And the, uh, the giant, or the Riser project, was a huge network of tunnels underneath the Owl Mountains towards the end of the war. They were digging big tunnels, 
it was thought perhaps to be um, the headquarters of high command if Berlin fell, or possibly a secret weapons project. Mm -hmm. Operation Paperclip personnel were very interested, which is where this next bit comes in. Indeed, a number of Kamler's blueprints were found in the personal possessions of one of the scientific leaders of the Alsace mission. From this place. So what do we think? Well, personally, I think he's dead. I mean, he's dead, but I think he was killed. He might have escaped, and therefore escaped justice, um, because he clearly had no conscience. So, I would like to believe that he was killed. Preferably, brutally. That's what he deserved. It's chilling to imagine that he may have escaped to freedom. But in reality, he most likely died in combat or was otherwise killed in the closing days of the war. He was a well-known and recognised officer and the chances of his evading such an overwhelmingly determined and prepared force are slim. He wasn't a very nice man. He was a tosser. He was a, he was a real piece of work, especially being in such a position of power. Unfortunately for historians, Vast quantities of documentation and physical evidence were destroyed by Nazis of all ranks in an attempt to conceal their crimes, and it must be assumed that Kamla followed suit. That said, until solid evidence surfaces, we will probably never know his fate. Depressing end. Oh, there he is. Screw that. It's a good shot. Alright, I need another cup of tea.